Welcome to our third Letting Library Lecture Series of 2022 entitled uh, Preservation, Three Perspectives. Change happens every day in our lives, in our communities, and in the universe. Without change, life would be boring or even non-existent. But our past, like historic buildings, help tell our story where we began and what to either repeat or do better in the future. Tonight, we, are he we will hear from Councillor Beatty on the importance of preserving buildings and structures inside Milwaukee. Jason Allen on the state resources that are available and the advantages of preservation. Steve Bennett on how to research your home's history and Michael Schmier on a personal perspective of owning a historic home. Thank you in advance for joining us tonight, and a special thank you to Scott Stoffer, Katie Newell, and all the City of Milwaukee staff for allowing us to conduct our lecture series inside the beautiful Letting Library and on Zoom. My name is Greg Hemer. I am the Communications Director of the Milwaukee Historical Society, the owners and operators of the world's largest museum dedicated to the history of Milwaukee, Oregon, located at 3737 Southeast Adams Street, open Saturdays, 1 to 5 p.m. Yes, we have a museum, that one building you've been driving past for 15 years and have never stopped in, but trust me, it is well worth your time to visit to learn more about our historical past from all perspectives. Milwaukee Museum prides itself in telling stories as the past is the past, no matter if it's good, bad, or ugly. We, were, we work with organizations like Oregon Black Pioneers, Clackamas County Heritage Council, Japanese American Museum of Oregon, and the Grand Ronde to expand our knowledge and tell the histories of all people that have lived in the area we call Milwaukee today. Our membership dollars pay for the operation of the museum, making a mission free, removing barriers of income inequality for all those who want to learn about our great city we call Milwaukee. Although 2021 was challenging, we were allowed to open our doors again in June and held three free performances at the museum featuring kid-friendly performers, bringing in over 300 visitors. We also published Art and Wild Adventures on our website, updated our technology, and held four Letting Library lecture series. Milwaukee has changed over the years new buildings and businesses, a new landscape, many new residents, and yet places still captured in time. Milwaukee Museum's newest exhibit is entitled Milwaukee Then and Now. The exhibition displays side-by-side -side comparisons of locations around the city with original photos to the present day. The exhibit delivers visitors a glimpse into how Milwaukee and life has changed over time recalling nostalgia for lifelong residents and perspective for new residents. Some of Milwaukee then and now photos include City Hall, Main Street, several businesses, schools, Kellogg Lake, and more. Artifacts relating to the photos of the then and now theme include relics from the Crystal Lake Amusement Park, now Crystal Lake Apartments, a 1950s telephone, switchboard, and more. The Milwaukee Museum, located at 3737 Southeast Adams Street, is open Saturdays from 1 to 5 p.m., and admission is free, but donations are always accepted. Visit Milwaukee Historical Museum on Facebook or email us at milwaukeemuseumgmail.com. Do not miss our performances at the museum on the second Saturdays of the month during the summer. This is possible by a grant from the Clackamas County Cultural Coalition and a great partners, Professional Fools Productions, Two Sisters Play Cafe, and Milwaukee Lumber. Do not miss our first show June 11th with Miss Pearl performing two shows at 1.30 and 3.30. It will be on the back lawn of the Milwaukee Museum located at 3737 Southeast Adams Street. Please bring a blanket or lawn chair. Admission is free, but please, but please, feel free to tip the performer. Miss Pearl's variety show features Heather Pearl's solo clown show and is a feat to be marveled at. 
Her inventiveness and abilities astound and surprise all ages. The show has a variety of juggling, magic, dance, and even underwear. Pearl has performed at theaters, festivals, libraries, and on the street. The show can culminate in a hands-on circus for all. Milwaukee Museum will be open during, before, and after the performances to create a fun-filled day for all family members. We will feature different artists in July, August, and September, so check our Facebook page for more upcoming performances. Milwaukee Museum is funded through donations and membership. Consider becoming a member today. For an individual, it's only $20, and for a business, it is $100. By becoming a member, you will receive information about upcoming events, member-only gatherings, and the opportunities the museum can offer you. As a business membership, provides advertising on all of our literature and provides opportunities for museum involvement in your events. Either way you become a member, your dollars will help ensure that you are preserving Milwaukee's history for future generations, and you are contributing to wonderful programming like tonight's event. Check our website at www.milwaukeemuseum.com for more information or stop on in the museum to join. Councilor Beatty was born in Oklahoma and lived in a number of states and three foreign countries before settling in Milwaukee in 2022. Soon after moving to Milwaukee, she became an active member in the Island Station Neighborhood Association, in which she served variously as chair and secretary for several years, and on the Citizens Utility Advisory Board. Lisa subsequently served on the Planning Commission for nine years, serving as chair for the last three. She has been a member of the board of Celebrate Milwaukee, Inc., the community nonprofit that sponsors the Milwaukee Sunday's Farmer's Market, in 2018, Lisa was proud to serve as one of the founding board members of the new Milwaukee Parks Foundation. A lawyer by profession, Councillor Beatty works for the federal government. But Councillor Beatty feels that much remains to be done to improve the livability for Milwaukee's current residents, as well as those who might move here in the future, such as finishing Milwaukee Bay Park and other area parks attracting new businesses to invest in our industrial and commercial areas, and establishing a robust emergency preparedness program, improving public transportation options through creating a shuttle system connecting industrial areas and neighborhoods to light rail is important to Councillor Beatty, as, it is the re as is the removal of Kellogg Dam and restoration of Kellogg Mount, Street, Mount Scott Creeks to salmon bearing streams. Such projects will require funds far beyond the city's budget capacity and are challenges she hopes the council will take to help Milwaukee become the more vibrant, livable place we all know it can be. Councilor Beatty serves as council president from January 2015 to January 2019. On a personal note, Lisa inspired the Milwaukee Museum to have our first ever historic home tour in 2019. Her willingness to participate and be an active member of the tour enticed other homeowners to follow. Her dedication, not only to her 1912 home, but also to the preservation of buildings in Milwaukee, has created a true atmosphere of not only the benefits of preservation, but the contributions these buildings provide to our city's history and climate goals. One thing I can always tell you about Lisa is that she will listen to what you have to say. She will take in that information and she will relay it back to the council or to the people that should hear it. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce Councillor Lisa Beatty. Well, thank you, Greg, for that very warm introduction. You reminded me of some things I didn't even remember myself. Um, so as Greg mentioned, I, I live in a 1912 home. I bought it in 20, he's, he, I, I moved here in 2000 and 
I moved to the area in 2001. I bought the house in 2002. It was my first home uh, that I bought and I'd ever bought. I was a little past my 40th birthday and the home inspector said, looked at me with kind of wild eyes and said, this is not a starter home. <laughs> um, there were a lot of projects. There was a lot to do to get the house with rotted faces and rotted porch boards and all kinds of things uh, back into shape. Um, but it's been a labor of love and I've really enjoyed doing it. And um, so anyway, that, that's my own story as to why I'm, I'm keen on historic preservation. Um, I wanna read a little quote that kind of picks up on some of the things that, that Greg said. Historic preservation is a conversation with our past about our future. It provides us us with opportunities to ask what is important in our history and what parts of our past can we preserve for the future. Through historic preservation, we look at history in different ways, ask different questions of the past, and learn new things about our history and ourselves. Historic preservation is an important way for us to transmit our understanding of the past to future generations. That quote comes from the website of the National Park Service. And people probably don't think of the Park Service as a historic preservation entity, but it's a big historic preservation entity in our country. Uh, it maintains a lot of you know, important, historically important properties. Um, so in Milwaukee, we talk a lot about climate. We have a climate action plan. And I think um, people think that Historic buildings are old and drafty and really just need to be replaced with something more, uh, you know, ener with energy efficient. Well, the truth is historic preservations are the greenest buildings we have. Um, it's the ultimate recycling project. And the, the construction materials that were used in older buildings tend to be more durable. The work of refurbishing Older buildings relies on your local craftsmen and your local people and isn't about just buying off the shelf parts from the Lowe's that were built in China or wherever. Um, so I think it's a really a fallacy in a lot of people's minds that, um, that I, just, I think a lot of people just don't realize that um, historic preservation is a green enterprise. It is the environmentally right thing to do in many cases. Um, the, uh, and one of my own stories, so in my house, I have the old windows, you know, you know, the guys come around to your door, you've probably all had it, where they want to sell you windows or they want to sell you siding. And I'm like, no, I'm not putting your aluminum siding on my 1912 house. And no, uh, I know my windows are not the most efficient. Um, they're that old wavy glass, um, but there are, constantly people coming up with new things to help you make your home more sustainable. And one of the things, one of the products that's been developed in recent years is called Indo, which is an indoor storm window. And instead of replacing these beautiful old windows, I could just buy, get fitted these indoor storm windows that I pop in for the winter, I pull out for the summer. Um, much less expensive than, and then, you know, replacing all my windows and, you know, preserving the historic integrity of the home. Um, so turning from my own story to Milwaukee's story, uh, Milwaukee's way behind on updating our, our historic preservation code. Yes, we have one. We have an inventory of buildings. We have two lists. We have the significant and the contributing historical properties. Those haven't been updated since the 1980s. Um, we're really behind. It's a thing I bring up every every year when we talk about priorities and things that need to get hap happen. And um, we redid our um, comprehensive plan a couple of years ago, and it did, does call for us to update all of that. But it also calls for us to do a ton of other things that we have to update. And so, historic preservation is still a few years out on the to-do list for the staff. Um, but I think we're at an important juncture here where it's becoming more important because we did recently just enact new housing code that is allowing for middle housing. Um, it was mandated by uh, state law, but it was something we were going to you know, do anyway, but sort of the scope of it and the extent of it was mandated by state law. 
Um, and so now we have, you know, the ability for homeowners to build a threeplex, a fourplex cottage, cottages or townhomes on their properties. And it now, I think, that creates more of an incentive where we are more likely to see some of our historic homes removed for that kind of, you know, those are just going to be financial decisions that I think people will make. And so I do think it's important to move more quickly on our historic preservation work. Um, at a recent city council meeting, Mr. Hemer offered the museum's help in updating our historic inventory. Um, and I do think, I, you know, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I don't know that we have to, to wait for the city. I mean, why can't we start, if we have people who are interested in that kind of work, why can't we start building our own list of homes that we feel, oh, and it's not just homes. I do focus on homes because Milwaukee is largely a residential community, but we do have buildings that we should think about um, conserving in our downtown and in you know, other commercial areas and possibly in industrial areas, although I can't really think of one in the industrial areas. Um, but anyway, uh, why can't we start why can't we get a head start on what the city will eventually do so that there's a list for when the city turns to the work for them to start with? So um, if anybody out there listening to this is interested in helping with that kind of work, or if anybody just has a, lives in a mid-century, I, I, I do want to say a little bit about mid-century homes because our list hasn't been updated since the 1980s. In the 1980s, mid-century homes were only 30 years old. They weren't eligible, they weren't thought of for historic preservation. So we have a lot of cool mid-century homes in Milwaukee because the 1940s and the 1950s were a big building boom in Milwaukee's history. Um, so if anybody out there has a mid-century home they want they you know want people to know about or they want to uh, you know get on the radar screen for some protection, uh, if anybody wants to volunteer to help with this kind of work, please contact Mr. Hemer at the museum. Uh, you can also contact me through the city's website. You can find my um, email and feel free to contact me as well. Um, but I would love to find, you know, create a team of, you know, four or five people who would like to just start in on the process of identifying um, and listing homes for, uh, for us to think about uh, as we approach historic preservation in the coming years. Um, so I do think, uh, anyway, I've given my pitch for mid-century. I think that's what's the big gap in our, uh, in our inventory, but I think there are other, other eras and other buildings too that, um, that warrant some attention and, and some scrutiny for, um, for the gems, the sort of little hidden gems that they are. Um, and with that, I will thank you very much, and I look forward to um, what I'm gonna learn here, so thank you. By the way, the Milwaukee Museum, through their work through the Historic Home Tour, does have a list of all houses in Milwaukee from 1970 and earlier. Uh, and so we have started that process, uh, and so we look forward to working with our fellow residents our city council and our state historic preservation office to get that accomplished. Thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you, Councillor Beatty. One of our partners uh, in programming like the Letting Library Lecture Series is the City of Milwaukee. The streets become the residents' playground with Carefree Sunday. Milwaukee Signature's Open Streets event will be returning to the city on Sunday, August 7th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Come out and bike, walk, roll, or otherwise move around without a car. Water Tower Park, Wichita Park, Ball Michelle Park, and Grace Point Church will be hosting activity stations with vendors and fun activities for the whole family. Come down Harrison Street to visit the Milwaukee Museum booth and other fun activities or create your own fun uh, in front of your home if it is on the route. 
The last time was a hoot and holler, so do not hesitate to join the fun. For more information, visit milwaukeeoregon.gov events slash carefree Sunday. Our next speaker is Jason Allen, the Preservation's Program Bureau Chief at the Oregon State Historic Preservation Office. A native of Philadelphia, he came to Oregon in 1996 to study history and archeology span at Oregon State where he graduated with degrees in both fields in 2000. In 2000. After a few years conducting archeology, archeological, I was gonna, I screwed this up during my uh, uh, being out in the field doing uh, archeology. span He attended Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, gaining a master's degree in historic preservation planning in 2004. Returning to Oregon, he worked in the private sector, consulting on cultural resources before joining the staff of the State Historic Preservation Office in 2012. As Chief of Preservation Programs, Mr. Allen coordinates the staff leads of the National Register, State and Federal Tax Benefits, and Survey and Inventory Programs to ensure alignment with and success of the statewide Historic Preservation Plan. Please put your hands together and welcome Jason Allen. How's my sound? Good? Great. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending uh, in person here at the beautiful New Letting Library. And for those who are watching at home, thank you as well. Uh, it's my pleasure to have been invited to speak to you tonight. My name is Jason Allen, and I am the Historic Preservation Programs Bureau Chief at the Oregon State Historic Preservation Office. Tonight, I'll briefly describe our office, talk a little bit about the National Register of Historic Places and what it is. Uh, what listing in the National Register means in terms of regulation, some of the historic or some of the opportunities listing opens up for owners of historic properties, and what the process for listing uh, property looks like. And then I'll close by telling a brief story that takes place about 160 years ago, uh, but that I think is instructive, and even today as we attempt to preserve the historic built environment that we've inherited. The State Historic Preservation Office resides within the Heritage Division of Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. In addition to the State Historic Preservation Office, the Heritage Division also includes the Heritage Outreach Bureau, which manages our grant programs, Heritage News and other publications, our social media presence, the Oregon Main Street Program and the Historic Cemetery Program, as well as organizing events and meetings such as the Biennial Oregon Heritage Conference. Additionally, they are the tip of the spear when it comes to critically important job of connecting people with each other and with resources that facilitate historic preservation in action. The State Historic Preservation Office comprises the two other bureaus, including the Regulatory Compliance Bureau and the Preservation Programs Bureau. The Historic Preservation Programs Bureau houses the non-regulatory functions of the State Historic Preservation Office, including the National Register, survey and inventory, and state and federal tax incentive programs. The National Register itself was created in 1966 by the National Historic Preservation Act and is maintained and administered by the National Park Service. The NHPA also created the State Historic Preservation Offices in order to, among the other roles that I mentioned earlier, administer the National Register process within each state and territory. 56 years later, the number of listed properties in Oregon now exceeds 2,000 individual properties and over 150 historic districts. So what does uh, historic listing mean? At its core, National Register listing is meant to be honorific, uh, to recognize the historic significance of important buildings, structures, sites, objects, and districts for their own sake. Uh, while some communities have elected to provide varying degrees of regulation at the state and federal level, there are no restrictions associated directly with listing in the National Register, aside from a mandatory 120-day delay on the issuance of demolition permits or permits to move a building. Although this is part of a statewide planning goal, uh, statewide planning goal five, it is also itself administered at the local level. 
um, you'll see that this is kind of a, a recurring theme, historic preservation happening at the local level. Um, there are, however, uh, certain benefits that come, uh, that become available to historic properties that are listed in the National Register, and some of these are identified here. Uh, for one, it obligates the federal government to address impacts to such properties as part of project planning, another outgrowth of the National Historic Preservation Act. In addition, a number of historic preservation-oriented grants, both public and private, are uh, used listing in the National Register as a requirement for qualification, and there are uh, opportunities to request uh, and obtain variances from some elements of the building code in order to preserve historic qualities of a property. And these generally do not include uh, fire and life safety for obvious reasons. Uh, finally, though, there are federal and state tax benefits available to owners of historic properties, both designed to incentivize preservation of historic buildings and to ensure that they stay in use. The federal government is an, is an sorry, the federal program is an income tax credit designed to reduce the cost of major rehabilitation projects for income generating properties up to 20% of the total cost of the project. So for example, a $10 million major renovation for a downtown historic property gets $2 million in income tax credits to offset the cost. The Oregon Special Assessment Program, which is designed to be available separately or to couple with the federal incentive when the qualifications of both of those programs are met, provides an alternative assessed value for properties undergoing important qualifying restoration or repair work for a period of 10 years as a means of essentially redirecting money that might otherwise be paid in property tax into preservation projects in the property. So, <laughs> yeah, it did not reproduce uh, very large. So for my friends who are eager to review the regulations associated with listing properties in the National Register, uh, as well as those with excellent eyesight. Uh, this slide provides a flow chart indicating how, nomination, how the nomination process goes and the applicable state and federal regulations that provide the rules. Uh, for those of us with normal interests and less than outstanding eyesight, uh, what follows is a brief overview and some basic information to know if you're considering nominating your property for listing. Uh, I'll add that graduate courses are offered at the University of Oregon on just this subject, and sadly, um, I've been given less than 10 weeks to talk, uh, so I'll encourage everyone to visit our website uh, to get more information. Uh, the address is uh, on the last slide at the end of this presentation. So the process for nomination usually begins uh, with the submission of a historic resource record, or HRR, to our office. This is when the owner transmits to our office everything that they already know about the, the property and some photos to, to help us get a sense of the building. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll look at this information and, and give you some feedback, typically with a lot of hedging words like it may be eligible or it appears like a good candidate or, or something like that. Uh, usually with some thoughts on, on research avenues to, to, to kind of dive down and explore. Um, some other buildings that uh, have been listed to, to look at for guidance. Uh, some thoughts on what the challenges of uh, might be, uh, that you might be facing uh, when trying to get the building listed. Um, and we hedge, not because we're dealing, uh, but only because we're dealing with incomplete information at this stage. Um, so the idea being that, uh, you know, based on what we're seeing, we'll give you the best opinion that we can and whether it makes sense to, um, uh, to move forward at that point is, is yours as the, the property owner. Uh, if the challenges appear significant, we will communicate that to you uh, so you can decide whether to take it on or not. So when you send an HRR, uh, what is the SHPO looking for? Uh, when it comes to eligibility for listing in the National Register, when you boil it all down, there are two primary considerations. First, is it a historically important place Specifically, is it significant? And that word is, a, is a, a word that is in the regulations and it is a, an important word. Uh, just being old is not enough. Uh, it must be the place where something important happened uh, it, or it must well represent a broader trend that shaped our history, uh, be a, the best reflection of a person of historical impact 
or have its own historically important architectural, engineering, or artistic merits. What you've already discovered about the place may suggest to us potentially valuable areas of research to explore. The second thing we're looking at is the property itself, specifically what we call its integrity. Uh, we're looking for alterations that may have been made since the time that the property attained its significance. Depending on why the building is important, there may be some variability in terms of the standards for integrity, but overall, uh, the building really should look, uh, should be well recognizable with few alterations since its historical significance was reached. If a building has had significant changes and faces challenges based on integrity, we might recommend some rec restoration uh, before moving forward with the nomination. Uh, note that these are all judgment calls, not science. Uh, this is how it goes. Uh, in historic preservation, there's no formulas or, or if-thens. It's all subjective decision-making. Um, and this is why we have the extensive review processes, uh, which is what I'll uh, discuss next. Uh, but first, um, a few points that I want to make up front. Uh, anyone may write a National Register nomination themselves. Uh, there's no required qualifications or degrees, but it is a highly sp uh, specialized document. Uh, with very particular requirements uh, established by the National Park Service. And I, I appreciate uh, the counselor mentioning the National Park Service is perhaps not something that everyone thinks of immediately, but they really are the core of uh, American historic preservation. Uh, most of the, the functions at the federal level happen at the National Park Service, and they provide us with most of the guidance that we, that we use. Um, but uh, you know, our office will assist you if you choose to take on writing a nomination yourself. Um, uh, but if you've never written one before, it, it may involve a fair amount of back and forth uh, between us. As long as you keep at it, we'll be there with you. Um, and, uh, uh, but we can't do more than give you feedback and suggestions. Uh, sadly, uh, we don't have the staff to write nominations. Some states do, our office doesn't. Uh, we, we generally have one uh, National Register Program Coordinator, a uh, gentleman named Robert Olguin, uh, who is not available to give this uh, discussion tonight, so I'm giving it in his stead. But he will be happy to hear from anyone that contacts him, and, uh, and he will assist you. Um, so, but second, uh, because of the length of the process, which can take a year or more sometimes, often less, uh, but sometimes more, um, it can become tedious, uh, especially when we're trying to really hit the fine points that the National, Reg or, sorry, that the National Park Service wants us to hit. They have very specific expectations for these documents. Narratives go in a certain order. Arguments for significance must fit into specifically defined realms, and they require a lot of table setting by establishing historic contexts, those historical storylines kind of uh, into which your property will fit. Uh, here I'll mention that there are professionals who specialize in preparing these documents, and largely this is all why. Uh, the more familiar you are with the idiosyncrasies of this process, uh, the easier and faster a nomination gets completed. Um, and finally, as I said, it does take time to get through the process, and a fair amount of that time is waiting. Uh, if you're in a hurry, start early. Very briefly, uh, because again, I could spend quite a long time talking about all of this, um, specifically about how to prepare a nomination. Uh, these are the parts of the nomination. Here you see the first page of the uh, Federal 10900 nomination form. Um, there are 11 sections to the National Register nomination form, uh, the most intensive of which are sections seven and eight. Section seven is the narrative description of the property. Uh, this is the thorough and complete and often lengthy description of the property. Familiarity with architectural terminology is pretty important here. Um, it includes not just the house, for example, but also the overall property, uh, outbuildings, uh, landscaping, etc. Section eight is the narrative statement of significance. This is where the challenge lies for many people taking on nominations themselves and that we must first understand the historic context within which the property is significant. So, for example, uh, let's imagine a Queen Anne style home uh, that was the residence and offices of a pioneering phys physician of the 19th century. In this scenario, we may be nominating the building both for its architecture and also, for, also as the place most closely associated with this important individual. 
Section eight of that nomination must establish the history and characteristics of the Queen Anne style of architecture and describe how this building is an especially good example. There must be a comparative analysis that demonstrates the merits of this building against others of its type. We must then establish the significance of the doctor. Uh, this also involves a comparative analysis against other prominent physicians of the time so that we can demonstrate that she was at least among the top in her field. Then we establish the significance of her work. What were the conditions before? What was the nature of her pioneering work? And what was the lasting impact on medicine? Uh, once we've established all that, we must also demonstrate that this is the place most closely associated with her contribution to the profession. Now, not all nominations are that complicated, uh, but I mention this as just an illustration of the sometimes kind of achingly academic nature of these documents. Um, it just is what it is. So now the review process uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the review process is spelled out in both federal and state regulations and rules, and we may not vary from, the, from those regulations. Uh, this is especially true of the waiting periods these are only really waiting periods for the preparers. Uh, there are reviews taking place in the background uh, in our office, for example, and with uh, local historic landmarks commissions. Um, and this is, uh, this is why these periods are described in the rule. Uh, the first review is the staff review. This is the back and forth between the preparer and the National Register staff at our office. Uh, there are three entry points for submitting a draft in, er, uh, in March in July and in November. This review takes as long as it takes to get a draft that's ready for the next step, review by the State Advisory Committee on Historic Preservation. The State Advisory Committee on Historic Preservation is a nine member body of governor appointees, leaders, and accomplished professionals in their fields related to cultural resources, historians, archeologists, architectural historians, et cetera. Between finishing the final draft of the nomination and the hearing by the SACHP, there's a 70-day waiting period during which the nomination is reviewed by the SACHP members privately and by the local Historic Landmarks Commission for their comments. That period is as long as it is because those bodies typically meet only once a month, and sometimes it takes two of those meetings in order to get onto the agenda for that, that, meet, that committee. Um, the, uh, yeah, sorry. So once the nomination reaches the SACHP, uh, they'll present their thoughts, advice, concerns, and discuss the nomination at the hearing, a public meeting that preparers often attend and provide feedback, suggestions, and a recommendation to the State Historic Preservation Officer. Preparers may also provide testimony and answer questions from the committee. Let's assume that all that went well and they recommend that it be forwarded to the Park Service for listing with a couple of small changes that they recommend making. Following the meeting, the preparer will st and staff will make final revisions based on the committee's comments and pass the nomination on to the State Historic Preservation Officer. Uh, in our state, it's the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer who runs the Heritage Division. This person is Chrissy Curran, uh, and she will review the nomination and recommendation of the SACHP and then make her own recommendation to the National Park Service. This review period is generally 90 days, though it can be accelerated under certain circumstances. Uh, let's assume that Chrissy agrees with the State Advisory Committee on Historic Preservation and recommends that the National Park Service lists the property. The final step is the National Park Service's National Register Review staff. These are professionals whose job is solely to review National Register nominations against the standards and expectations of the National Register program. Their review period is 45 days. At the end of that period, the property is either listed in the National Register of Historic Places or the nomination is returned for a revision and on very, very rare uh, times, um, it's rejected by the National Park Service. Very rarely does that happen. We usually uh, have a sense that something like that is going to happen early on, and we don't want to waste anybody's time. So we'll try to veer off into a different direction if, if we sense that something like that's going to happen. So assuming that all goes according to plan, the property then gets listed. 
Uh, as you can see here, a lot of time is invested in the property, or sorry, in the process, and no small part of that is waiting for key dates and, and to arrive and review periods to pass. As I mentioned before, listing does open a number of benefit opportunities to owners, and so it can be a necessary step toward taking advantage of those benefits, but I'll also say, really, the listing itself is meant to be its own reward, which is official recognition that this place is indeed historically special. Now, I've described a lengthy process uh, and possibly intimidating, uh, but I wanna be clear that our office is here to assist you or the professional preparer that you've hired to get through this process. This is one of our primary functions uh, and we take it very seriously. Uh, we will not leave anyone out to dry um, or leave them in the lurch uh, in the middle of a process. Uh, the review process is collegial. Uh, the people involved at all levels, I promise you, are very friendly and helpful and supportive and are all there in the spirit of public service from the beginning to the end. In addition, I can tell you that once it's all completed, the sense of accomplishment is pretty great. Uh, so now for the story that I promised. Uh, history, after all, is about stories that resonate with us as communities and that tell us about who we are and where we've come from and the events that brought us to this point. A word of warning, there is much legend around these events and it's difficult to separate fact from inspirational fiction uh, concerning the details. However, the central truth of the story is not debated. Uh, I'll point that part out at the end, a message that I hope that you'll take away from my brief time uh, with you here. So the story takes place at, the time, at a time of sectional factionalism uh, when tensions were very high and the greatest national trauma in our history was on the horizon only a few years into the future. The country faced splitting itself apart and the national experiment appeared to be at risk in the mid 19th century historic preservation in the United States as we know it today begins. It was then that the first effort to faithfully preserve an important historical building was undertaken for the sake of serving an important, as an important reminder of our shared history for the benefit of the people of the country. This is Mount Vernon, the home of George Washington as it appeared at the time our story begins at this point, the building is already nearly 100 years old after George Washington's death in 1799 and that of his wife Martha in 1802, Mount Vernon passed to the son of Washington's younger brother, John Augustine Washington, and then through successive generations of that family. By 1855, about the time this photo was taken, um, the property had come to Washington's great grand nephew, John Augustine Washington III. In the decades prior to his inheritance, the family fortunes had declined dramatically to the point that the property could no longer really be maintained. As you can see uh, by the, the sagging roof line there on the porch, the scabbed in supports, missing pillars, and, uh, and deterioration of what looks like a stone facade but is actually wood uh, carved to look like stone. Uh, the buildings and property were indeed in a sad, sad state. Perhaps recognizing the building as potentially symbolic of a moment in history that bound the sections together, John Augustine sought to have the building, sought to save the building for all Americans as a symbol of national unity. And to that end, to make sure that it would be open to the public in remembrance of the first president, whom for many embodied the central thesis of the Republic. John Augustine offered to sell it to the federal government for $200,000 a third less than he'd been offered by a private owner or by a private uh, purchaser. For reference, that's the equivalent of about seven and a half million dollars today. Uh, the truth of his motivation may be more legend than truth. Uh, the same argument is put in the mouths of others uh, in our story. Um, so take that uh, such as it may or may not be. Uh, regardless, when Congress declined, which seems hard to believe today, uh, he made the same offer to the state of Virginia. Uh, which incredibly also declined, uh, possibly because he was committed to finding a way of keeping it open to the public and not just becoming the private residence of another person, or possibly because he was implored to do so by his wife at the urging of one or more possible buyer. Uh, he, put off, um, he put off accepting the offer from the private purchaser until he had spoken to the next star of our story. 
According to the most popular version of this story, one night in 1853, while passing by on a steamer on the Potomac River, Louisa Cunningham found herself stunned and horrified to witness the condition of the property, which looked very much like it did in the photo that I had up earlier. Um, it sits prominently on a hill above the river, and you can see it as you go by, headed towards Washington. Uh, she was so distressed that she wrote to her adult daughter, Anne, uh, lamenting the shame of it that this place, sacred to our country, should be left to decay, suggesting that if the men of the country weren't willing, then maybe it should be the women of the nation to save it. Anne Cunningham, moved and inspired by her mother's letter, was compelled to begin an effort to save and restore the building for the people of the country. Driven, she formed the Mount Vernon Ladies Association in 1853 and immediately got to work, organizing an extensive nationwide barnstorming and letter writing campaign to raise money and public support for the, property, or for the purchase and restoration of the property with the goal of opening, to, opening it to the public. At the first meeting held at Cunningham's home, they raised $293.75. Uh, which is a long way from $200,000. Uh, as Ms. Cunningham was from a well-to-do South Carolina family, the initial effort was taken on by Southern women, but at the insistence of Ms. Cunningham, the effort was widened to all women, both North and South. A very controversial move, the sectional, sectional mistrust was high uh, and, th and threatened to destroy the effort in the cradle. Uh, Anne and her supporters continued to stress the ability of the effort Sorry, uh, Anne and her supporters continued to stress the ability of the effort to transcend these divisions. Uh, see, uh, nevertheless, opposition continued, carried by high profile celebrities on both sides threatening to completely undo the effort. No less a leading figure than Elizabeth Cady Stanton was vocally opposed, as were many notable abolitionists and Northern politicians. Southerners felt ownership over Washington as a Virginian, refused to cooperate with the Northerners, but nevertheless, she persisted. It's worth noting here that as the effort began to gain traction and the organization began to realize some early successes, John Augustine III withdrew the property from the sale agreement, reportedly out of a wounded ego, and the belief that women would mismanage the property. And Cunningham spent the next two years, so the story goes, and believably enough, nursing his pride and reassuring him until the property was finally secured by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association in 1858. There is much more to the story, and the time here is short, so I'll skip to the end and make my point. Uh, faced with what must at times have seemed like insurmountable obstacles, including skepticism, ridicule rooted in sexism and the devastating sectionalism that would shortly sink the country into the brutal civil war. Uh, the home of the first citizen of the United States, as Washington was sometimes called, was achieved through the persistence and dogged determination of a group of people that recognized its importance. The effort to save Mount Vernon was ultimately successful and the property has been preserved and open to the public ever since. Faithful restoration of the property began the very next year, and new discoveries made since that time have continued to guide further restorations. Uh, this is my son and I in the lower right here just three years ago. Uh, Mount Vernon, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, incidentally, continues to own and operate Mount Vernon today, operating completely on private contributions. I relate this story because the message, I think, is clear. And it is this, historic preservation, like many efforts, is seldom successful without the visionary leadership of a dedicated champion and the support of a broad coalition of the public. Historic preservation was not at that time and is not always now a priority for government. Despite the recognition over the last 55 years that historic preservation is in the interest of the nation and state, evidenced by the existence of the State Historic Preservation Office, it is and has always been through the dedication and action of private individuals and groups creating a critical mass of support that the preservation of important places is finally achieved. 
And with that, I'll wrap up my presentation. Here's our website address. Uh, there's tons of good information there, uh, including the Historic Sites database, which I encourage everyone to poke around in. Uh, with about 70,000 entries in it, there's a lot of Oregon's built heritage to see, uh, and more of it's getting added all of the time. Uh, please also visit our, our website, which covers everything the SHPO does, uh, and many, many helpful links. And finally, most of all, I want to encourage everyone to get involved in whatever way makes sense for you in the long-term preservation of Oregon's built history. The properties we have today are the gift that came to us uh, from those who came before. And let us also, in turn, give that gift to those of us who come after us. Thank you all very much. This program would not have been possible without the Letting Library's great work. After being closed because of COVID, it is back open. Check it out Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., Friday and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., and on Sundays, noon to 6 p.m. Even if you don't want to check out a book, come inside and see the award-winning design. Letting Library was on the cover of November Library Journal, received a merit award from American Institute of Architects, and an honorable mention from the International Interior Design Association. Looking for a gift or something for yourself? Go to the Friends of the Library bookstore. Find something for the reader in your life. Check out their website and visit their Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Pinterest accounts for library updates, programs, and information. On an extra note, Katie Newell has been a library director since 2011. Not only is she willing to allow Milwaukee Museum to tell our shared histories inside this wonderful building. But her determination, grit, and hard work has paid off to the residents of Milwaukee in this beautiful building. Katie said it took a village to raise this building, but without you, our village would have been lost. Thank you for your wonderful years of service, and we hope your next adventure is just as fulfilling. Truly, Katie, thank you. Steve Bennett devotes his time, work, his time to working with individuals and organizations who share his love of history at the individual and local level. He works with historical societies like Clackamas County and further their missions of collecting and preserving our collective artifacts and stories. He works with the individuals to help them discover their past as a way to enlarge their future. Dr. Bennett has a wide ranging academic background, BA in philosophy, MA and PhD in Near Eastern languages, an MBA in management. He worked in information technology as a project manager for 30 years and is now retired. Over the past several years, Dr. Bennett has focused his attention of local property research, helping many individuals uncover things they didn't know about the places and people who contributed to making them who they are today. You know, sometimes it's just kind of funny how the universe works. Steve came wandering into the Milwaukee Museum, researching his home, looking for articles about Mr. King, the original owner. Over time, Steve developed a relationship with us, a bond, a friendship, maybe even a little bit of love. Today, because of a few visits, Steve brings his intellect, knowledge, and experience to our board. We are ever so thankful to have him as a volunteer. Ladies and gentlemen, please walk, welcome Dr. Steve Bennett. Thank you, Greg. That was more than kind. Um, welcome to everyone here. Uh, Thank you to uh, the city. Thank you to the Letting Library for holding this. Uh, it's, it's truly an honor, and I'm, I'm looking forward to what I hear tonight. Um, thank you all also for coming out, and for those viewing in the future, thank you for taking the time to, to view these, these talks. Um, as I was getting ready for this presentation, going between 60 degrees in rain and 80 degrees in sun, <laughs> 
I was struck by the need of maintaining some kind of balance, balance between the alternating weather uh, outside. And it became a theme for how I want to structure what I'm going to talk about tonight. This is balance. Uh, I'm going to balance or try to balance between stories and what might appear to be dull facts. I'm going to balance between what I mean by property and what I mean by house or home. I'll, and I will talk to you about what the, what the differences are and why they're, why they're important in what I'm saying. So um, a little bit more about me. Uh, I was born in, or in Salem, grew up in Oregon City in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, my father was a physician there, uh, fairly well known in the community. I left after high school uh, to get my education, uh, all the degrees that I have, and, and some that you didn't even mention. Uh, mostly on the East Coast, uh, we moved back to first New Haven, Connecticut, and then down to Baltimore, Maryland, lived in, in, uh, Mar in Maryland for 30 years, so where I worked uh, also. Um, retired in 2018, moved back to Oregon uh, with my wife, and uh, settled in Milwaukee, which I will be honest, growing up in Oregon City, Milwaukee was just a town we drove by on the way to Portland. <laughs> so I could have gotten lost the first day I was here uh, and just trying to make my way around, uh, around the, the town. Uh, but I, like, I love Milwaukee now and, and Greg is right, I wandered into the museum and, and we, f we, found, we found each other. <laughs> Um, yes, I do work for the Clackamas County Historical Society and the Milwaukee Historical Society. I'm on the board of both. I've researched at both. I'm a docent at the uh, Milwaukee Library there on the second uh, Saturday every month. Um, so come by if you want to talk more about property. Um, I think it's also fair to say that I've never worked as a surveyor. I've never worked in a title office. What I'm going to share with you tonight in terms of process, in terms of doing research and, and in telling a story about some, some of that work. Uh, I come by by just learning it myself and, and picking it up and doing a lot of reading and working with maps and all kinds of things. So I've got a lot to learn. Uh, I value those people who have been in it for longer than I have. Uh, but uh, I do come by th some things, uh, honestly, a uh, love of genealogy, a love of history, and, and now a love of property research. So, goals. What I want to do tonight, it's easy to, to confuse, or not confuse, but use the terms property and house or home um, as if they're the same thing. And I'm going to distinguish them I want to keep the concept of properties different from the property, from the concept of a house or a home. Uh, and I'll make that clear, so why I'm making that distinction. So I want to make that distinction for us. I want to provide some examples of what I learned from doing the research for myself. Uh, I do a lot now in helping others uh, explore their property, uh, go through the process of figuring out who owned what, when. Um, I want to provide some sense of the tools to get you started with that, but mostly I want to encourage you to get engaged uh, in, in this process, either doing it yourself or working with us to, to help you understand uh, the history of your property and the history of your home. Uh, so, oh, I didn't send you the updated one, okay. I, I reverse these slides. <laughs> so, what I want to talk about tonight, as I mentioned, is, is balancing the difference between property and home. And I'm going to do it by uh, saying that a home is a structure. It could be a doghouse, it could be a barn, it doesn't have to be the house that you live in. It's a structure that's built on a piece of land. Uh, and I think it's useful to think of the questions that you would ask if you wanted to find out more about that particular thing, whatever it was. So for a house or a home, you might want to know, well, when was it built? Who built it? What's the architectural style? 
these are all in, these are all questions uh, that you would have, and it, you would want to know more about in your if you're doing your research on your house and trying to figure out what happened with it. You might also have a question about the floor plan. Is it the same? Uh, has it changed? Um, when did it change? What things have been done to that house over time uh, that vary it from how it was originally set up? Uh, that could be an important thing for you to know. And the last thing is, if it's, is it where it was built? You have McLaughlin House here in 1909 being moved up Singer Hill from its downtown location in Oregon City to the top of the bluff. Milwaukee Library, the, the Wise Farmhouse, was moved. So there are many older homes in the area that aren't where they were originally built, and it's important to know that. So you want to know, is your house where it was first built? If not, where was it before? When was it moved? These are all questions. The last one is, where is it located? For us, that's usually the street address. No particular street, it's just a, just a picture. Um, but if you think about those questions for a moment, you'd realize, I think, that there are very few places that you're gonna go to get the answers to all of those. You know, there's not usually one document that's gonna give you all that information, except if, unless it happens to be a historic home and it's on the National Register, that's, you know, you were in luck there. But more likely than not, you're gonna to have to work at and go to a number of different resources to find the answers to those questions. Let's contrast that with property, as I mean property. Property is just a piece of land, not the buildings that are on it, just the land itself. And what are the questions that we can ask about property? Well, what's it used for? What did it look like? Was it part of a larger development in a city? Before it became part of a city, was, you know, it, it was there unless you're thinking in geologic terms, and I'm also really interested in geology, but unless you're thinking in geologic time, that land hasn't moved. Houses can move, the land hasn't moved very much. So what's important to know are, what, you know, what are the boundaries of that land? How big is it? Who owned it? Who owns it now? Who owned it in the past? What's that history of transmission? And as I said, the boundaries and where it's located. Now, with the exception of the first two questions on that list, all those questions can be answered in one document, the deed. And that's what people usually are looking for when they want to get started, is that deed to understand the property. Now, that's, that's a deed from 1902 of the property that I showed you in the previous picture. Um, all of it, from about a quarter of the way down onto the next page is the description of that property. Not the address, but the physical description of starting at this point, going 255 feet westerly, you know, on and on and on, so you can draw the line that defines what that piece of property is. That's part of what you're gonna get in that deed, is that legal description. Um, but there's more in, in a deed, and they're really important, and I'll give you some examples of how they could become important. Uh, but I'm gonna stress a lot the working with deeds because that's what I do a lot with. Uh, obviously, you've got the buyer and the seller. You've got <clears throat> the, date, excuse me, the date when the transaction took place. You've got witnesses. You've got other things that are mentioned in in those deeds that all contribute to understanding the history of that property and how it's changed over time. What you won't find in the deed is anything about the structures. All I was going to say is everything that's on it, all the habitable, you know, all the things that occur on that piece of property, they go along with it. But we're not interested in telling you anything about them. So. Uh, 
In rare occasions, you might find that, but for the most part, your house and the home is not going to be on there. So, three important things to remember to start with. Addresses don't equal property location. And when I say address, I'm talking about the street address. Um, addresses can change, streets can change, the, the locations of streets can change, the names can change. Knowing your current address is helpful, but it's not going to get you very far. And I will tell you from personal experience, if you start this process and you walk into the recorder's office up in Red Soils and say, I'd like a copy of the deed for the property at such and such an address. They will tell you, we don't work with addresses. They will point you to the phone and say, here, call the tax assessor's office. We'll give you the number. Ask for the reference number of the most recent legal deed on that property, and they will give you a number. Give that number to us, and we'll look the deed up for you, because they work off of that reference number. Uh, and I say this because every time up, the, up there, at least two or three people are coming in and, and starting their conversation exactly that way. I want the deed to my property. Here's the address, and we don't work with addresses. So just be aware of that. It will save you some time and aggravation. It's not impossible. The tax assessor's office does work with addresses, but they don't keep the deeds. The recorder's office does. So I promised you a story. I'm going to talk about the house that we live in. The King House, <coughs> excuse me, on King Road. A little plaque in the front says the King Home. <coughs> Built about 1910 in Ardenwald, a home of historic interest. Not on the National Register. But a home of historic interest. So we moved into this house in, in 2018. Uh, saw it, fell in love with it as we drove by. We're renting, by the way, which will become obvious. Um, and we worked at a deal to get the house. Uh, we were told at the time that we were looking at it that it was built by a Dr. King with his own hands, and he performed surgery in the basement. Well, I knew the house is owned by Providence Health Association, Providence, owners of Providence, Milwaukee. They own the property, they own the house. It's right next to the hospital, but not even the Dwyer Hospital that was there as a private hospital before went back to 1910. So the likelihood of this being built by a doctor by his own hands, I was dubious. But that was the story we were told. I've also heard, heard stories that the doctor lived in the next house down and he used to burn bodies in the basement. <laughs> I've been to that house because it's now empty, uh, and I don't see any burn marks on the walls. <laughs> but you never know. What bothered me was that I knew it was a King House. I went to the Letting Library and the Milwaukee Historical Society uh, Museum, and I looked in some of the older Milwaukee histories, and I saw a couple of cryptic references to a Pat King, and maybe his son went to Milwaukee High School, but nothing else. I turned to my genealogy skills, looked in the census records, no census record in 1910, no census record in 1920. I was coming up with a blank. There were kings around, but not Patrick Kings or Pat Kings, and nothing that made sense, at least not without some kind of context. Until I was using the Historic Oregon Newspapers uh, website run by the University of Oregon, which I highly recommend to anybody doing either property research or house research. And I found July 11th, 1911, this entry for John and Nellie Scott selling to Patrick King some land in the Daniel Hathaway DLC, the donation land claim, uh, for $2,500. Well, I knew enough where we lived that we were on the edge of the Daniel Hathaway DLC. Not in it, we were right next to it, 
uh, so I think the paper got it wrong. I know why they got it wrong, but they got it wrong. But this was enough. I now had a buyer. I now had a seller. And because I had the, t the paper dated to January, uh, July 11th, I knew I had a date that was pretty close to the transaction. Again, if you're dealing with looking for old records, old newspapers had real estate transactions all the time listed. So it's a good place to go if you're trying to find when a piece of property was sold. At least it gets you started. I won't go into the DLC now. This is, that's way too much information. But if you don't know anything about DLCs, please look them up or come by. I will be glad to, to help you understand the importance of the donation land claim system and, and the fact that almost, well, I won't say all deeds, but many deeds in Oregon have that DLC even today listed in the, in the legal description. It is so important to understanding the context of where a particular piece of property is. So I want to spend a little time, again, I'm, I'm balancing between a story and going into some details. Working with deeds. <clears throat> if you're a property owner, you probably already have a deed. You should have gotten it at settlement, even if you never looked at it. Uh, but it's, it's the deed to your property. It lists who you bought the property from. It lists you know, the, the legal description and everything else. So if you're trying to work with deeds and f understand your property history, that's a great place to start because you have the names and the information that you need. All, the count, all of the land information uh, about land sold in Oregon is kept in the county offices of the, of the county in which the land is. So Clackamas County has all the deeds for property in Clackamas County, um, even if the land owner is out of state, that de you know, the, the official copy still resides there. For recent deeds, if you're, if you're just getting started and you're working with your own property, most of those are either online or available on computers. But for about 120 years of land records, from 1850 up to the 1980s, you're going to be working with microfiche and microfilm in the recorder's office. That's just the way it is. So if you're lucky enough to be working with Polk County, all of their records are online, every single one, uh, but not so for Clackamas. They're working at it. But I wanted to give you two keys to success. One simple, ask for help. When you go to the recorder's office, First thing you want to do is you want to find out where everything is. Where are the computers? Where are the readers? Where, where are the microfiche uh, files, the indexes, the, uh, the actual deed books themselves? What do I, you know, where do I go? How do I get started? They will help you to get you oriented, but they're not going to do the work for you uh, unless you're working with your own cur uh, current deed or something that they have in the computer, but they will be very helpful and they're, and they're very kind about it. Uh, the other thing, and I'm going to dive right directly into it, is knowing the difference between direct indexes and indirect indexes. And this gets down to a level of detail, but you work with, if you're doing property research, you will be working with these indexes all the time. So it's really critical to understand the difference. When you find, a, just to highlight the process, when you find in this index the reference number that you're looking for, then you'll go to a different microfiche or microfilm. You'll pull up the copy of the deed, print it off, and you're, you're on your way. Uh, that's basically the process. Here is a sample of an index. This happens to be a direct index. Just to understand how they work, Keep in mind, you know, I stressed the legal description of a property to begin with. That's not going to help you when you're trying to find this deed. You need, to, you need to have the names of the buyers and the sellers and preferably a date. Because as you see, and I know that this is hard to read, and, it's, and yes, they are all written in cursives and by various people, so you will have to bone up on your skills. But everything is indexed on the far left side chronologically in groups, you know, deeds from 1910 to 1923, and it will start from the beginning and work its way down. 
then the next two columns are the, are the person's name, uh, another set of names, then a column for those reference numbers, book and page. Book, book 87, page 469. And then the final, two col the final columns over here are information about the property and where it is. It's not the legal description, it's just a, a, a help to you if you're looking for something in Township 2 South, Range 1 East, you see a two and the one there. If that's, if that's a piece of property that you were looking for in that location, you know that that's a pretty good chance that you've got the right one. Now, direct index. The direct index is alphabetized, more or less, on the seller's name. So if you're looking for who sold the property, you want to go to the direct index. And you're going to look usually from the start of that time period, and you'll see that the names are not strictly in alphabetical order. You've got Steele, then Stevenson, then Steele, then Stevens, and then Steele. They alphabetize by the first three letters of the, of the name. And it, beyond that, it's all in chronologic order. This is just how it works, and, you'll, and you make your way through, and you look up a deed reference, and you look, go to the deed, and you pull it up, and you look at it, and then you look at that legal description and say, is it the same piece of property? And if it is, you've got the right deed, okay? The indirect index, exactly the same information, but based on the buyer. Direct index for seller, indirect index for buyer. If you are working it backwards, starting with yourself and the house property that you own, you bought it from somebody. You want to go to the direct index and look at that person's name. Who did they buy it from? And then you go back to the next one. Who did they buy it from? And then who did they buy it from? And you trace it back. If you have, in my case, I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure what, who, who bought it. But I did have a buyer and a seller name and a date, so I could go to the right date. I could either go to the direct index and look for the seller, John and Ellie Scott, or I could go to the indirect index and look for Patrick King. Either one works fine. All right, so that's, that's working with those. I wanted to kind of illustrate, again, the importance of, let's see. Hmm? Oh, I'm, I'm pressing the middle one. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to before I get before I jump into the King deed. This is this is the one I wanted to share another little story with you. Battery <laughs> about working with information in the deeds like this one, and how it's important to pay attention not just to the buyer and seller, but also the other information. About a month ago, I was asked by a, a, a person to research a family member of theirs. She had a deed, number, a page number, and she knew that the last time that she had had any contact with this person was 1942, and she wanted to know when he died. Scratched my head a little bit and said, okay, I'll work with that deed. The deed happened to be from 1926 when he bought some property in Estacada. Uh, and I reasoned, all right, I've, we've lost track of him altogether in 1942. We should be able to track as he sold this piece of property in Estacada. So I went f using the direct index, sell after sell after sell after sell after sell, until th that trail ran dry in 1953. So I knew he was selling property in 1953, 11 years after we lost track of him in Oregon. I reasoned, well, 
he's selling property in Clackamas County, but he probably doesn't live here. So I went to that last deed and looked at the end, and sure enough, he had it notarized in Duval County, Florida. So now I know that he was living in Florida in 1953, and that was easy to go to the Florida archives and found a death certificate in July of 1959. Did not, if I didn't have that deed, I wouldn't have easily been able to prove that it was the same person in Florida who owned the property in Estacada. But I had a deed with him uh, notarizing it in, 19, in 1953, so I was reasonably sure it was the same person. Deeds can tell you more. You know, I, a, another way it could have happened is I could have gotten a probate record. Uh, but anyway, it, it's helpful to have that. So let's get back to the King story. Here is a copy of the deed for this property. Nicely typewritten, fortunately. But here are the important things that I dis discovered out of that. It says at the very top, and I know you probably can't read it from, from, from where you're sitting, Patrick King of Ellendale, North Dakota. So now I knew I had a Patrick King and I knew he didn't live here. He lived in North Dakota. Sold by John and Nellie Scott. I had the property reference, that second paragraph, so I, could, I knew I could track the, the history of the property based upon that. I had the date when the transaction took place and any restrictions that might be in the deed in terms of what you can and can't do with the property, who can live there, you know, is there a well or a water right that the previous owner wants to maintain possession of? All that would be spelled out. The names of the witnesses, the date when it was recorded, that's on the next page, I didn't include that. But the other thing that's very interesting about that is that it says at the bottom of that second paragraph that there's a road there already. So it made allowance for 20 feet off of the property for a road. So I knew that there was a road in existence in 1911 where the King House is. So I want to give you a little bit more about the Kings just to kind of fill that story out now that, I, now that I was able to track them down. Patrick King, born in 1848, he died in 1937. He was born in Prince Edward Island in Canada, part of a Roman Catholic community that had come from Ireland. So we could trace him, him back to Ireland. He moved to Wisconsin, uh, married Mary Ellen Berry and there and, start, and started a family. And he was in the lumber business. He worked for his uncle for a while, and then the family moved to Ellendale, North Dakota, when it was just becoming a city, just becoming platted for that matter, uh, and lived there until he retired in 1911. Had a family with eight children, uh, and he and his wife and two of the children moved from Ellendale to Milwaukee get to why I think he moved to Milwaukee. I know that he had been to Seattle and been to Montana on, on, on travels because he would write better back and I was able to look at newspapers in North Dakota and see the entries saying, Patrick King just got back from Seattle where he was on lumber business. So there was lots of disinformation that all of a sudden appeared. He was also very busy when he got out here. He was elected to city council from in 1912 was on the city council until 1915 during the, the period of E.T. Elmer, the third mayor of Milwaukee. So Pat, and then all of a sudden you find all kinds of newspaper articles about Patrick King and the, and the Milwaukee city council that I had no way of knowing that were connected when I first got into this, but it all started to move, fit together and make sense. So I know he wasn't here in 1910, so no 1910 census. They left in 1917. So two years after he was off of the city council, the family picked up and moved back to North Dakota. So he was not on the 1920 census either. I wouldn't have found him either way. Uh, I mentioned that two of the children uh, moved with them, the two youngest of, out of eight. Um, 
One of the things that I have so far not been able to crack is finding a picture of him. And I don't know whether there's a picture someplace buried in the city records. I haven't found one. I've not found one any place. I haven't gone to the lengths of trying to contact members of the King family and say, I know all about you. Uh, can you give me a picture? Uh, I don't know how well that would go over, uh, but I could try. Um, but remember I mentioned that there was a story about his son being in Milwaukee High School. Uh, James Wilford King was in fact in the 1914 first class at Milwaukee High School. And there's this picture, he's the tall one in the back. The four, that's the, the total class of the 1914 Milwaukee High School first, first class. Um, and some other people like Rachel Berkemeyer that people around here might know, uh, well-known Milwaukee names. Um, his sister, Florence Elizabeth, was going to be in the class of 1916 at Milwaukee High. And in fact, at the Milwaukee Library, there, we've got a copy of the Maroon, the, the student uh, yearbook from 1916 that has a, some information on Florence King, but it ends by saying that she transferred to Washington High School in Portland, so she didn't finish in Milwaukee. And then, of course, the family left. Um, So that's a little bit about the Kings. Now back to the property. I, of course, did trace it back from the Scots to the lads, back to Hector Campbell, who, whose DLC the property is actually in. But here's the list of people who owned the property since uh, the Kings left in 2017. Thomas and Anna Vastendahl uh, were from North Dakota also. They were also in lumber. Uh, they were from, uh, Thomas was from Iceland originally. Uh, he died in the mid-20s after having sold the property to his wife. She sold it to uh, Louis Kuykendall, uh, split the property, built the house just down the next door to us, and she moved there herself, and Lewis moved into the big house. The Steers, and I hope I'm not mangling names for people who are longtime residents and who know some of these people, because I know people have come up and said, well, I know the Bells, uh, the next family that lived there. Uh, Lawrence Caramella was a well-known radio personality in Portland uh, when he was living in this house. I. Don't remember him from the 50s, the 50s, 60s, or 70s when he, was, when he was active, but I didn't listen to that station probably. Uh, but I do know that he was. He was bought by North Clackamas Hospital, which is now owned by Providence Healthcare in 1978. They split the property. Their main parking lot outside the emergency room used to be part of the King property. So the original property for that house was just under two acres. It's now just under a half an acre in size. Um, a little bit about the house. I have made some progress in actually trying to figure out the history or, or the, of this house itself. It's a craftsman bungalow, uh, which was extremely popular at the time that it was built in 1911. Uh, I don't know who built it, although they mentioned in newspaper articles that the Kings started building it in July of 1911, right after they purchased, and they moved in in October of 1911. Uh, so it was pretty much done by then. Uh, he wrote a letter back in November to North Dakota and, and talked about Milwaukee. Uh, and said, well, it's a great, nice place to be. Uh, we've got 60 minutes, we've got oh, 60 minutes. We've got a cow and we've got 60, 60 chickens. I've got a nice little garden back in back. I can get to Portland on the electric train for seven cents and it takes about 20 minutes. Um, and I found in the Letting Library this picture of the house taken from the newspaper in 1916. So. This is what it looked like in 1916, as close as I could get to the same perspective today. All right? Um, 
At the time it was sold, it was, the largest, it was said to be the largest real estate transaction in Milwaukee. They sold the house to the Vatson Dolls for $6,000. So I need to wrap up. I will pass on talking about King Road, although I will mention, I still haven't been able to prove it's named after Patrick King. <laughs> All right, so I've got three pages of references here. Uh, we'll try to, you know, they'll, they'll be available on the, on, the, on the slides and if you watch it and if you get a hold of me, then uh, we can get you more information about these particular references. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for rejoining us. We have moved to the wonderful Willamette Falls Studios for the continuation of our Letting Library lecture series entitled Preservation, Three Perspectives. Tonight you are seeing this program because of our great partner, Willamette Falls Studio. Willamette Falls Studio's mission is to inspire lifelong learning, advance knowledge, and define communications through digital media technology to educate and strengthen communities. Their professional staff work daily to create media content for local organizations, capture city projects, consult on productions, customize broadcast systems, and provide technical support. The staff at WFS works with all levels of experience in media production. Any residents of the five service areas can learn how to be a WFS producer at little to no out-of-pocket cost. All they require is playback of your final project on the public channel. Come in and talk to their staff about how they can help with your communication needs. Essentially, WFS provides residents with a porthole into their community. Through televised local government meetings and community-produced programming, coupled with the training to create and share their views, residents have a unique opportunity to not only access a community's global perspective, but also help shape it. Michael Schmier is locally born, his family having lived on Francis Avenue just off Concord Road, and his grandparents on Oakfield Road. He attended Concord Grade School before his family moved to the Seattle area in 1957. Finishing the school system there, he gradu graduated from the University of Washington with a bachelor's degree in forestry in 1971. Returning to the Concord area that same year, he married Shirley in 1977, and together they raised two children who also attended Concord. He worked for PGE for 30 years, most of which was as PGE's transmission forester. He retired in 2005. A great-grandson of the 1852 Oregon Trail pioneers, John Preston Berry, and his wife Martha, Mr. Schmier's interest in our local history has, was sparked when his grandmother told him that their house was built by Philip T. Oatfield. Mr. and Mrs. Schmier live in this house today, and he and his family are enormously proud of their connection to our local history. His interest led him to collect photos and history of the Oatfield family and to assist in co-nominating the giant sequoias of Oakfield Ridge to Clackamas County's Heritage Tree Program in 2008. Mr. Smear is the 11-year president of the Oak Lodge History Detectives, is on the Clackamas County Historic Review Board, a board member of the Concord Partnership, a member of the Clackamas County Concord Task Force, an avid genealogist, a life member of the Genealogical Forum of Oregon, and a member of the Oregon Historical Society, the Clackamas County Family History Society, and the Milwaukee Historical Society. Now, I cannot remember the day or even the year that Mike and I started to communicate. We are kindred souls, he and I. I, too, graduated with a forestry degree and passionate about our local politics, share the love of local history, but also we both believe that our history is knowledge for the residents to learn and understand. Oak Lodge History Detectives and Milwaukee Museum are partners through and through. 
Not only do we share the inner struggles of organizational work, like presenting information to an audience or how to function as a historical operation, but most importantly, we share the knowledge each group has, working side by side, understanding that our relationship between the regions we focus on is not a competition, but a region that is closely tied together in its history and importance. Mike, your dedication and willingness to pursue the passions of spreading our shared history is remarkable. Thank you for not only being our colleague, but also our friend. Please welcome Michael Schmier. Thanks, Greg. I'll be available for autographs after the program is completed. Yeah, um, this talk is considerably different than most talks I've given in the past. Those talks have usually been about early Oak Lodge settlers, residents, their donation land claims, early surveys, the evolution of their land, abstracts of title, the trolleys, early Oak Lodge businesses, that sort of thing. But this talk is different. It relates to Oak Lodge history, yes, but it's also personal. This talk is about my house. <clears throat> Full disclosure, mine is not your typical owning a historical house scenario. Most people buy a house with some known history and then learn about it. I grew up with mine. When I was growing up, my grandparents lived in a neat old house on Oldfield Road. It was two stories, had a basement, tall ceilings, had a huge yard, three acres to run and play in. It was not at all like the house I lived in. My grandparents' house, set way back from the road, had three huge giant sequoias in front, woods on two sides, a well house, an apple orchard, pears, walnuts, berries, and grapes. It had absolutely beautiful grounds with lots of different critters and even chickens. It was like our own private park. To me, it was a magical, heavenly place, and it became a wonderful place of family gatherings for 70 years. That cute kid in the middle in the dark sweater is yours truly, of course. And that's one of those family gatherings way back in the day. It wasn't until I, a, I was a little older that my grandmother told me that her house was an Oldfield house. That didn't really sink in much then, but it certainly did a little later. About the time I was to enter college, I got curious about the old fields, and I started asking my grandmother questions. She referred me to a daughter of Phil Oldfield, Irene Lodian, who lived a mile down Oldfield Road from my grandmother. Irene blew me away by giving me a great history of the Oldfield family and their genealogy. I began to understand just how influential the family was to our community and I began doing more research and compiling it. My own family had moved to the Seattle area in 1957, but after college in 1971, I moved back to Portland, married, started spending a great deal of time at the Oldfield Roadhouse helping out my grandmother. My, grandmother, my grandfather had died in 1966, leaving my grandmother a widow. In 1978, my grandmother deeded me her house with a reservation of life estate. Around 1980, my grandmother had to move to a nursing home, after which my wife and I our, and our son moved into the house. Grandma died in 1988. Because we had learned a fair amount about the Oldfield family, my wife and I basically adopted the Oldfields 
and set out to learn as much as we could about the history of the family. We were avid genealogists, so researching was, and remains, second nature to us, and we made use of many of the resources typically used by genealogists. We also had lots of help. My father remembered when my grandparents had moved into the house. He described some of what he remembered and identified a few items that the Oatfields had left behind. In addition to Phil Oatfield's daughter, Irene, we learned that his other daughter, Inez West, had returned to Portland following her husband's death and was a member of the Genealogical Forum of Oregon, the GFO, where we volunteered. We hosted a GFO picnic at our home and made, us, made certain to invite Inez. She arrived with wonderful stories to tell and described things throughout the house. And later on, she visited us and gave us her mother's ceramic clock. She also loaned us her family photo album and lavished us with more history. Needless to say, I had duplicates made of all her photos while I had that opportunity. Many years later, I had occasion to meet Phil Oldfield's granddaughter, Gloria Stone, Irene's daughter. By then, I was the president of the Oak Lodge History Detectives and was clamoring for historic photographs of the Oak Lodge area. Gloria had inherited all of her mother's history and photos and those of Inez. She loaned me all of them, all of them, including original deeds and other documents pertaining to the Oatfield and Thiessen families. I launched into a scanning frenzy and built a digital library worthy of a museum. So this is Phil Oldfield's house, my house, built in 1922. You can see in the foreground, the uh, lawn had the lawn area had just been excavated and leveled and was pre being prepped for seed. And to one side of the house, to your left, are several cords of firewood. On that side of the house, to this day, the basement window is all scarred up from throwing firewood through that window to store in the basement. They had a, a, a wood stove, a kitchen, wood, wood burning kitchen stove. This is after the lawn was built. So this is around 1923 with freshly poured concrete curbing, front sidewalk, and two little um, tiny little maple saplings in the front that are enormous today and lifting the sidewalk. This is Phil Oldfield in 1903, sitting on the steps, uh, the porch of his first house, just up the road from us um, in his rocking chair. There are, we have other photos of uh, another photo like this of his father sitting in that same chair. This is a cute picture of Phil Oldfield back in the day, probably taken at a fair or a, uh, some kind of a event in his bowler hat. And this is a picture of Oldfield in his family car driving down our driveway, his driveway then. Lucky for you, there isn't nearly enough time to show them all to you. Phil was the oldest son, the third oldest child of Michael and Minerva Oldfield. Michael was born in 1835 in Austria his surname back then was not Oldfield, though. It was Haberfellner, H-A-B-E-R-F-E-L-L-N-E-R. -E -E in 1853, the Haberfellners left Austria and immigrated to the United States, along with Michael's siblings, his, his mother, and his stepfather. They settled in Union County, Illinois, and it was sometime between 1854 and 58 that he changed his name from Haberfellner 
to Oatfield, which is a loose translation, a field of oats, from the Austrian name. In 59, Michael headed west and arrived in Baker City, Oregon, eventually in 1862. He secured employment at Joseph Kellogg's Sawmill in Milwaukee. And in 1863, rented property from the Kellogg's south of Milwaukee, um, where later on his, he established his farm. So in 1867, he bought 540 acres from the Kelloggs, from Oren and Joseph Kellogg. He died in 1909. All of this information provided us with a vast knowledge about the Oldfield family and their influence on Oak Lodge history and gave us a huge basis on which we developed an immense amount of pride. Besides being the third oldest child of Michael and Minerva, being a local farmer, and owning 100 acres of his father's original 540 acres, Phil Oldfield had married his neighbor, Dora Thiessen, in 1903, and built his first house, like just up the street from us. This is the house where you saw him sitting in his rocking chair. So in this picture, at his first house, it was taken right after the house was built, that's Phil Oldfield standing out in front of the house, and his wife, Dora, and Michael Oldfield, his dad, and John Risley on the steps. He became vice president of the First State Bank in Milwaukee, along with... Um, also on the board, or as a director of the First State Bank, was his brother John Oldfield. He was intimately involved in the development of his local community. He took pride in being a farmer and was a close friend of the Oldfields, friend and neighbor of the, of the Risleys, the Thiessens, and many other notable families in the area. So this is a close-up taken the same day. That's Phil Oatfield in the lower left. Above him, sitting up behind him, is his wife, Dora Thiessen Oatfield. To Dora's side is Michael Oatfield himself. Next to Michael is John F. Risley. They were neighbors. Their properties abutted up to one another. Although we think of the Risley family as being clear down on River Road, they, they own property side by side, budding to Oldfield Road. And the little, little squirt next to Phil Oldfield there is um, one of the uh, Risley kids, Victor. Phil and his brother, John, operated Oldfield Brothers Farming for many years from their two shares of their father's original farm. One cannot browse through early road viewing records, surveys of the area, early estate records, without coming across the name of Michael Oldfield, Phil Oldfield, or Phil's brother, John Oldfield. They were everywhere. Though our house was still pretty much locked in a hybrid 1922-slash-1950s decor, there were, meant, there were only a couple relatively minor things that we wanted to improve while maintaining the original look of the house as much as possible. The house is heated with hot water radiators. This is the living room radiator. And this is the kitchen radiator. And, of course, there's a radiator in almost all the other rooms. We weren't about to change that. It's a wonderful heat, nice, even heat. No air blowing all over the place. The only drawback is that when you turn the thermostat stat off to tell it to stop heating, those hot water radiators don't know that they're supposed to cool off instantly, so it keeps heating for a while. So you kind of learn to compensate for that. 
The house has a porch off the kitchen through a door with a transom window. Oldfield had closed in that porch with windows and a door, and that was where he had his ice box, which is now just a storage closet. The house has a beautiful side porch where my own great-grandmother used to sit and knit and enjoy the fresh air on nice days. It has a full basement, complete with a fruit room where the oat fields and later my grandmother stored their canning. As a side bonus, it was a great place to threaten the kids with to lock, lock them up if they were bad. I never did that, but it was a good threat. The upstairs bathroom even has the original sink and clawfoot bathtub. The kitchen wood-burning stove is gone now, but the chimney inlet for it and the wood lift cabinet are still visible. I still have the crank for that old wood lift. Oldfield stored the firewood down in the basement, but they had a wood burning kitchen stove, and so they had this little kind of a, uh, a man lift or a wood lift that was just a platform about three foot by three foot that had this crank, and when he needed wood up in the kitchen, he'd throw some sticks of wood on there and crank the thing up, and it came, went up into a cabinet in the kitchen, and they'd pull it out of the cabinet and uh, use it for their wood-burning kitchen stove. The cabinet's still there, but my grandfather took the wood lift out some time back. But I did find the crank out in the garage, and it's kind of a neat memento. The laundry chute is also a, a great labor-saving amenity. Its only drawback is it only works one way. And we still use the tip-out sugar and flour bins in the kitchen. Those are original to Oldfield. The kitchen linoleum floor was a disaster. If you spilled liquid on it, it simply just disappeared in all the tiny little fissures. So we replaced that. But I'm amazed we haven't all died from asbestos poisoning from all the sanding I had to do. The upper kitchen cabinets have been refaced, but the glass window doors remain. We learned from Inez that the very high horizontal cabinet above our refrigerator was where Phil Oldfield stored his rifles. Gotta keep that. But the metal sears, cabinets, and surrounding the kitchen sink have far outlived their useful lifespan, and they really need to go. <sighs> My grandmother had redone the fireplace, so we restored it back to something more consistent with what we thought it might have looked like earlier, and redid the windowed cabinets on either side of it to store family memorabilia in. So those little cabinets on either side are my little museum pieces where, where all the little small little family memorabilia gets stored with little name, name tags to identify what they are. Removing my grandmother's birch paneling revealed that there were sconce lights there originally, so we reinstalled those sconce lights, and you can see them in the photo there on either side of the clock. And my grandmother's ugly, dark living room wallpaper and orange carpet were gladly replaced. The old electric fuse box in the basement was, was replaced by a modern 200 amp circuit breaker box and additional wiring was added to supplement the old 1922 knob and tube wiring. It's still there, I still use it, it's fine. And we replaced the gigantic oil-fired boiler with a compact gas boiler. I call our boiler, the gas boiler, my shredder. It's about twice the height of your typical shredder that you use to shred your, old, your documents. It's amazingly small and heats the whole house just fine. My grandma, grandfather had redone the main floor bathroom with a 1950s shower and homemade cabinets, keeping the original sink and toilet and painted the bathroom a lavender color. We, we redid that with a 1920s look, but
but with a modern shower, sink, and toilet. I'm embarrassed to admit that the main floor bedroom where Phil and Dora slept still has its original Oldfield wallpaper. Though vintage, that wallpaper is worn and stained in places, and it also needs to be replaced. I do, however, enjoy that that bedroom still has Oldfield's original hanging light fixture. When Oldfield's daughters put his house up for sale in 1950, my grandfather bought it. There were a few things left behind that still give me those nostalgic warm and fuzzies when I look at them. Phil's spurs. Those were down in the basement. Three kerosene lanterns. A 1906 scythe. Oldfield's hay rake. That main bedroom light fixture, an original Thomas Edison light bulb with the side porch, from the side porch, Dora's porcelain clock that Inez had given us. Then there's Oldfield's markings on a basement post recording all the family kids' heights, like we always did, and especially Oldfield's notes on the basement chimney and post recording the dates and times that he salted his meat and salmon. He wrote, he wrote a lot of that on that post there, but it's in pencil, and it's very hard. You can't pick it up with a camera, so I've rewritten it on that piece of paper there and posted it. So you can see, early in those early years, this is before refrigeration, he salted his meat and his fish regularly to keep it from spoiling. Old Phil also recorded the 51-inch height of his giant sequoias on a basement post in 1923. So that I found that written in pencil on that post and rewrote that too so I could so people could see it and I could show it off a little bit. All these notes are treasures, in my opinion. The windows and siding are all original. There have been no additions other than a covered back patio that my grandfather built in the 1960s. We did re-roof the house around 1990, and we painted it a couple of times. My grandmother took pride in landscaping the grounds over the years, turning them into a veritable park which to me is just as important as the house itself. The woods on two sides of the property and all the mature shrubs and open space provide habitat for a variety of wildlife in the area, in an area where such habitat is rapidly disappearing. The property is teeming with wildlife, which includes squirrels, raccoons, the occasional coyote, all manner of birds, owls, hawks, recently a duck, and oddly enough, we've even had deer. For the most part, Oldfield's house itself looks just the same from the outside as it did in 1922. That's largely due to the fact that we are only the second family to own it if you count my grandparents and us as one family. Of course, Oldfield's giant sequoias that were only 51 inches tall in 1923. That's a 1937 picture of the house with those giant sequoias. The trees are a little bit wider now and a bit taller. I have to say, that shot there is me hauling away the redwood needles that fall every fall. I haul away, on average, five pickup loads every year to get rid of them. The year of the ice storm was probably seven or eight loads because of the extra crap that fell from all the ice. Oatfield apparently recognized the symbolic historic potential of having majestic giant sequoias on his property. 
he planted four of them at that first house. And that's a shot of that first house with two of the giant sequoias in the foreground. In 1903, that are still standing today, knock on wood, and planted more again when he built our house in 1922. As president of the Oak Lodge History Detectives, and now being on the county's historic review board, I've had experience with Clackamas County's preservation ordinance and attempts to save a couple Clackamas County historic landmarks, mostly to no avail. That's Old Fields' first house just up the street, gone now. If I've learned anything from this experience, it is that preservation, at least in Clackamas County, is 1% ordinance and 99% stewardship. Oldfield's house is 100 years old this year. Like so many others with historic old homes, I take immense pride in owning Phil Oldfield's only surviving home. It and his now 150-foot-tall giant sequoias stand as a legacy to the Oldfield family and their role in the history of our area, and it is well worth preserving. I feel a huge responsibility in preserving it as much as I'm able. All of what I've shared with you is the fun part of owning this house. But here's the rub with trying to preserve it. Despite being one of the four original counties in the 1848 Oregon Territory, Clackamas County's Preservation Ordinance offers no, no incentives and no support to owners of historic properties. There is no assistance, not even an informational brochure. The mere fact that a property has been designated a historic landmark and hence falls under the ordinance does not guarantee that it will be preserved. It can't stop development from totally enveloping the resource, nor can it stop it from being torn down if that's what the owner wishes to do. In the end, it's basically a feel-good ordinance that can't actually preserve what it was intended to preserve. For numerous reasons, which I won't go into here, the ordinance is failing to achieve its intended purpose, and as a result, we are losing historic resources at an alarming rate with precious few new resources being added. It's a travesty, and this realization came as a terrible disappointment to me. In reality, in unincorporated Clackamas County, it's all about stewardship and only about stewardship. And good stewardship takes a love of history, dedication, a lot of money, a lot of time and effort, and good health. I am proud to be able to say that we consider ourselves to be good stewards of the historic Field Field House, but Clackamas County's Preservation Ordinance needs a major overhaul before I'm willing to nominate my home for historic designation. As an alternative, we're considering a conservation easement. That also costs money, but it is, if one is serious about preserving their home in unincorporated Clackamas County, that appears to be our best option. The issues surrounding Clackamas County's preservation ordinance are exceedingly vexing, but that is a topic for a totally different presentation at another time. For me, for now anyway, it's stewardship, stewardship, stewardship. I want to thank our speakers tonight, Councillor Lisa Beatty, Jason Allen, Steve Bennett, and Michael Schmier. I also want to thank Scott Stoffer of the City of Milwaukee, Melody Ashford of Willamette Falls Studios, Linda Carr of Milwaukee Museum, who helps run this program, and so many other things and especially Katie Newell, the Letting Library Director. Check out our next Letting Library Lecture Series, October 5th, where we'll be discussing the Native people, history, and culture. If you have any questions or want to learn more, 
Visit Milwaukee Museum on Saturdays, 1 to 5 p.m. Check us out on Facebook and our website. Join Oak Lodge History Detectives during their monthly meetings or find them as well on Facebook and the web. If you'd like to see this program again or tell your friends about it, look for it posted on the City of Milwaukee and Milwaukee Museum's YouTube page in the upcoming days. Once again, my name is Greg Hemer, Communications Director for Milwaukee Historical Society, the owners and operators of the world's largest museum dedicated to the history of Milwaukee, Oregon, the Milwaukee Museum. Thank you and wishing you all a good night.